morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Really pleased to have you here. We've got some really fun content to go through that Cesar has been working on for a, quite a while. So we're looking forward to this session with you. Today, we're going to be talking about how to build your core loops in machinations. So we're going to go through, we're going to talk about what core loops are. We're going to do a quick review and we're going to build some core loops from start to finish in today's session and then how to design and prototype them in machinations, what we're gonna be all about today. And we'll have plenty of time for Q&A as we go through. Thank you for letting me know the chat's now working. Uh, sorry, apparently Zoom's updated a setting somewhere. My name's Matthew, I'm the evangelist for machinations. And alongside me today, and the one doing most of the talking as always, is Cesar, a diagram craftsman. Say hello, Cesar. Hello, everyone. That's it, keep it so short and sweet, I love it. Um, so uh, for those of you that are going to be at Gamescom, it starts in two weeks today. Machinations are going to be there. If you want to come and uh, meet with us and talk about game design, talk about machinations, we'd love to meet with you. So if you're going to be in Cologne in a couple of weeks' time, please do let us know and we'd love to meet up. Alex Tran, who's uh, around in chat, he's actually going to be blogging from Gamescom, giving you the updates, letting you know what's going on. So feel free to follow him, and I'm sure he'll be posting details as we go through today. As always, we've got plenty of time for Q&A uh, as we go through, so I'll be keeping an eye on chat. So if you have any questions, please do ask them in chat. If you have a question, I'm sure somebody else has got it as well. So don't be shy. Please do let us know what your questions are. And we're going to bring just the one poll today, just so that we can understand who we've got with us. Uh, quick question, how complex are your current machinations models? Oh, not that's going to be not used machinations yet. Simple doodles, a few mechanics and systems or everything is in there. Excuse the typo, uh, but let us know how complex your machinations are so far. So we've got an idea of the skill set. We've really designed today's session to be ideal for people that are fairly new to machinations. We're gonna be walking through the, uh, the objects as we go through and build them. But if you are brand new, I'd always recommend watching one of our 101 sessions that's on our YouTube channel. I'm gonna end the poll there and I'll share the results. So we've got a good mixture. Some people have not used or not sussed uh, machinations yet. Uh, some simple doodles and a few mechanics and systems. Brilliant. So let's talk about core loops and what they are. So core loops really are the, uh, the essentially the very heartbeat of the game. They're the action, the series of chain of actions that is repeated over and over as the primary flow for your player's experience. The core essence of why we return to play the games over and over. Now, with any uh, machinations webinar, as you'd expect, We've got a machinations model, so a loop of building loops uh, that we kind of went through and defined as we were prepping for this session. So there's a series of steps that you go through when you're building out your core game loops. And so what we're going to do today is walk through this model. We're going to then go through some examples where Cesar is going to show us how he approaches this and how he builds the core loops of his models. So this is uh, kind of where we kick off. When you're thinking about your core game loops, the first step is to think about what are the actual core mechanics, what's the player going to be spending their time doing inside the game. That leads us neatly onto the next step, which is then defining the player actions. The next thing that you're going to want to be able to do is think about what are the resources that a player is going to be using and have access to when they're inside this game, and they could be whatever um, kind of makes sense for that mechanic or for that core loop. The next step, even at this very early stage, is what do we want to measure as we're going through this process and what's going to be the important metrics inside the game. Once we've done that, the next step is to test some of this logic. And then the famous part, my favorite part of this is then to iterate on this. And we might go back to any of these steps as we're going through iterating on these mechanics, thinking about where we could go next then once we finally settled and we're happy with our core game loop, there's a couple of things that we're then going to do. We might save our core game loop in a separate part of the diagram and then restart a new diagram to add the extra mechanics and the depth to the gameplay. Or we might just take that very simple game loop and start expanding upon it 
to make it a more complex model to add depth and more granularity to it. And we'll talk about those steps as we go through today. I'm going to hand over the screen sharing now to Cesar. So Cesar, for the first um, type of process, uh, I think the first mechanic we were thinking about is a kind of a play, pass, fail, a level leveling system or a puzzle type mechanic. So what are your, your thoughts there? Yeah. Um, so first of all, I want to mention that you can see some texts in here. These are going to be the game loops that we will be tackling for today as time allows it. Uh, what will happen is for each of these game loops, I will try to explain what the nodes are supposed to be doing, uh, what the thought process behind it is, and uh, try to follow the, the steps that we see here that Matthew just talked about as, uh, as thoroughly as possible. Uh, we decided to start off with kind of the simplest, let's say, mechanic of a game, uh, which is, in general, there will be a lot of games that have the concept of a level where you play a level and you can either pass it or fail it, right? A lot of a gigantic amount of, of games have this kind of loop. So what we want to do here is just to, to look at the core mechanic, which is pass or fail a level and what that means when you advance in a level or not. Um, so following the instructions here, the first thing we want to want to think about is uh, what are the core mechanics, right? So what is supposed to happen in a situation when you play a level? So you're going to have, uh, we're going to have our pool here, which is going to be our player. We'll talk about that in a bit. And essentially what will happen with the player is they're going to play the level and they're either going to pass or fail that level. So how, how is that going to happen? Uh, easily, it's going to be, let me change that. It's going to be either win or lose. We're going to be using a pool for our player. A pool is a simple node that stores resources in machinations. That's their only function. It's to, to store those resources. They can receive them. They can send them forward. So uh, we're going to use that to, to track our player. Next up, we're going to use a resource connection, which is the, the arrow that you see. You can see three of them right now. The resource connection has only one job, and that is to transfer resources. Resource connections will transfer resources uh, according to their label. So because I have a one in here, which is the default, this resource connection will transfer one resource forward between the pool and the gate. And speaking of the gate, uh, the gate simple job is to distribute resources according to certain rules. In our case, I will be using a random gate, switching it here in the distribution in properties. Random gate, which has the dice here, means that it will choose between the two available options uh, or outputs that it has. It can have an unlimited number of outputs. It can have one output. Um, and it will choose between the two. Now, in theory, I could leave this as one as and one. But to make it a bit more uh, understandable, I'm going to switch the chances to 50% and 50%. So as you uh, may suspect, that means that there's a 50% chance that the gate will select the, the upper arrow and a 50% chance it will select the lower arrow. I could have left it as one and one uh, because those gates, the random gates, look at the, um, the distribution between all of the available outputs. And because one and one are equal, it would have been the same weighted the chance. So essentially, it would have been still been 50 50%. So um, this is going to be a simple loop. We're going to name this pool win. We're going to name the bottom pool lose. And just as simple as that, once I have a resource in here, just play for a step. You can see it's, a, it's as simple as that. So the player won the level. Now, to expand a bit on that, <clears throat> there will be two, two things in here that we will add, which goes into define player action. So now we are thinking about what is the player going to do, right? So they're going to play the level. They're either going to win or lose. And what's going to happen when they win or lose that level? We're going to keep it simple here. Winning will essentially mean that they advance one level. Losing means nothing. We don't have any concept of lives or anything. And regardless of the result, the player is then free to play another level. So uh, those would be the actions that the player can take. Uh, because of that, on the win, a part, we need to introduce the concept of gaining uh, a level or advancing a level. So because of that, we're going to have a pool here, name it level. 
this is going to keep track of what level our player is currently at. I'm going to give it one resource initially. We start at level one. I'm going to go to display here, set it to minus one. So you can see that instead of the uh, token that I'm, I'm having here, I can see it as a number. So display of minus one means that whatever number is in here, I'm going to see it as a number instead of a token. And we're going to need to increase this level every time our player wins. How are we going to do that? We are going to use a source. Um, you can see the source, which is the triangle. This, uh, this node is only used to generate resources. That's its only function. So a source basically contains an infinite amount of resources, and they can generate resources according to your needs. That is their purpose. So in order to advance the level by one, I'm going to have my source point at the level pool with a connection of one. And uh, this is just going to create another resource in the level pool. I need to condition that based on winning. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to have the win pool actually trigger the source. So right now, you can see in my source, we have four trigger options here. My source is set to passive. A passive source does nothing, or a passive node in general does nothing. So if I were to play right now, you can see that my source is grayed out, doesn't do anything. If I were to set it to automatic, it would perform its action every step. So if that happens, I'm just going to gain a level every step, regardless of what happens. So I don't want that either. I only want the source here to send the resource whenever I win a level. So how's that going to happen? I will be using a state connection which is the dotted arrow. Uh, we have only two types of arrows. One is resource connection, which only transfers resources. The other one is state connection, which actually affects the state of nodes in general. So I'm going to use the, the state connection with an asterisk formula, which signifies a trigger. So whenever the win pool receives one resource, the source will trigger its action for a single step. You're going to notice I'm going to hit it step by step. Notice how the connection turned blue. That means the wind pool received the resource, and it's about to trigger the source in the next step. So we increase the level by one. And if I let it resume, it doesn't continually increase the level. So whenever we win, we increase the level by one. Now, something else you may have noticed is that once the player plays a level, regardless of the outcome, they are stuck in one of the two end pools, right? So we need to bring our player back in order for them to, to play the level again. In order to do that, I'm going to use a deterministic gate here. Uh, the difference between deterministic and random gates is that gates, uh, random gates distribute resources randomly, while deterministic gate distribute them according to a set of rules. Uh, I am using this gate in order to bring my player back to the initial pool here. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to draw two resource connection from either states here, win or lose. So regardless if the player wins or loses, I'm going to set the gate to automatic. So it's going to pull every step. It's going to attempt to pull resources every step. And I'm just going to send it back to uh, the initial pool. So you can see that the gate, aside from having one input and multiple outputs, it can also have multiple inputs and a single output. So in this case, I just want to draw resources from all available inputs and put them into a single output, which is the initial state. So now if I were to play, regardless if I lose or win, the player always returns to their initial state. And whenever they do manage to hit a win, the level increases. Uh, so this is just a very basic mechanic for, for a win-lose situation, right? For the answer of what do we want to measure, um, in, in this simple case where we only have uh, this much introduced, the easiest uh, metric to measure would be the level. So if I right click on the node, click show in chart, it's going to add it to my chart here. You're going to see it as a black line. Um, essentially, one game will mean two steps for us, right? Because one step needs for, uh, for the resource to choose win or lose. And the second step is for the resource to return to its original position. So you can see in the chart here, uh, I'm going to hit batch play soon. We have 100 steps. 100 steps equals to roughly 50 games. 
if I hit 20 batch plays, it's going to be 20 simulations of 100 steps that would be returned instant. So I'm just going to do that. You're going to see a bunch of numbers. You're going to see the, the chart firing up. Uh, after it finishes, you're going to see on the left here, it's at 85%. After it finishes, we can go and uh, check some interesting things here. In an indicators, we can see our average, our minimum, our maximum value. So what do we notice in this chart? Is that our level after 100 steps is at around, let me try and snap to the, okay, 26.65. So for a 50% win rate level, on average, our player got to level 26 in 50 uh, games. Our unluckiest player got to 19 and our luckiest player got to 34 as we can all see. So of course, we can notice that the, the trend is pretty linear for the average. That's because there's no really deeper logic in, uh, in the win-lose besides just the 50-50. Um, in reality, if we want to expand this model, we can add uh, a, a difficulty factor based on level. Let's say uh, more advanced levels are more difficult. We can give the player certain boosts. Uh, we can add a win rate in here just to see how the player is doing and so on and so forth. So we can clearly expand from this. But as a simple uh, nucleus for, for your model, this would be the starting point uh, where, you, where you create your level and then expand upon it. And Matthew, I think this would be a good time for questions if there are any. Perfect. So please do drop any questions into the chat. Uh, let me just see. Uh, Spawning creation of resources is a problem. How do you schedule this process and how do you allocate resources across the map? Also, how does the abundance slash scarcity change according to level? So in this very, very simple model, um, there's no real uh, complexity to it, just the very core loop. What you would then do to this model is probably the first mechanic you'd look at is the difficulty. So you probably want to create some kind of system that would control how complex or, or easy each level is. And you'd create some kind of um, way of manipulating those percentages so that it's not just a 50-50 chance for every, every game or every level the player plays. Uh, it would be slightly different. Um, then potentially looking at adding in um, other types of mechanics, maybe you're aiming at a free to play game and you want to then look at how you'd add in some kind of monetization feature like boosts or hints or something that would increase your win chance. And you'd add those mechanics in there and then test to see how fast the player is going to progress through the content. Obviously, there's huge amounts of data that we can then start to create, even with a model this simple, to, in terms of uh, if you're monetizing with ads, how many ads is a player going to watch as they go through this journey or how many ad opportunities are there? Um, all of these different systems, um, you can then start to really kind of build upon a, a very core loop like this to really add depth and um, start testing out how those mechanics are impacting your core game loop. Perfect. I just, I just want to mention that what we're building here, I don't know if any of you in the audience has ever played Path of Exile, like imagine the Path of Exile skill tree, this is the center of it, right? So when you build the model, this is going to be the core first part that you're going to build. It's going to be your starting point. And from, from this starting point, you're going to be adding systems left and right to make it more uh, thorough, right? Because a 50-50 chance is unrealistic. So. Uh, whenever you say, okay, you, you won a level, so you're going to get some rewards. That means you're going to add a small reward system on top here for winning. When you lose, maybe you have a life system. You're going to add a small life system on the bottom. Right? Uh, the chances change with the level increase. The rewards maybe change with level increase and so on and so forth. Those are things that you add, but they all start from this core center of your, of your diagram. You know? And what we're aiming to build right now is this core center uh, of the diagram. So getting a few questions on kind of how we would expand this, but actually I think what we're going to do, we're going to move on to the next mechanic. And I think we'll, as we go through building out some more of these core game loops, I think it'll help answer a lot of these uh, questions. One question that's coming in, is there a way we can simulate how much time a process would take? For example, I'd like to balance the amount of time it would take for a player to generate enough resources to upgrade to the next tier. 
Uh, but does machinations offer any option to modify the amount of time these loops would take? So again, machinations is Turing complete. So it uh, means that anything you can think of, uh, you can build inside machinations. So just as we added in here that uh, a source that goes to the level, so every time they uh, win a game, they pass the level, we can build something very, very similar for how much time does it take for a player to play a level? So rather than taking that trigger from the wind pool, we could take that trigger from the, the gate pool so that it's tracking every time a player plays a level. And then we could allocate rather than just the number one, if that was, it took 120 seconds, two minutes to play a, a puzzle, we could use that to create that. So we were tracking how much time it's taking. So all of these things are possible, but let's, let's talk about something, a slightly more complex model uh, and a core game loop, Cesar. So how about one way you're kind of training troops and using those to attack things and um, you know, you gathering resources that you're then using to build more troops? Yeah, sure. Uh, this loop is every Clash of Clans game ever, basically. Uh, in those games, usually you're gonna have your buildings that are producing resources. You're gonna build an army using those resources and you're gonna go in around attacking your neighbors or NPC villages or whatever. But uh, in those battles, you may lose some of your troops, you may lose all of your troops and the surviving troops are gonna pillage and uh, plunder and come back with some resources that will help you boost your economy. So while it could potentially be a, a positive loop, it can also be a negative one if your troops uh, die in battle. Uh, I'm gonna do a simplified version of it, uh, of course. And the way in which we're gonna approach this is, uh, so first of all, what are the core mechanics? The core mechanics are you have resources. I'm gonna keep them in a pool here. I'm just gonna name it resources, not, uh, not giving any particular names. Those resources you can invest in building an army. I'm gonna introduce a new node here, which is the converter. Um, and uh, those, uh, those resources can be converted into soldiers, as I said, and I'm gonna explain what the converter does. Uh, so let's say that we begin with 100 resources. And let's say that and it costs 10 resources to train a soldier, right? So I'm gonna use a converter here. Um, you see the input is 10, the output is one. The pool here will represent soldiers. Uh, what's gonna happen if I make this automatic, let me close the chart. And I play is that every step, I'm gonna take 10 resources and convert them into a soldier, right? So the converter as the name implies, takes a number of resources and converts it into the output amount. Um, we may want to do this faster than just waiting, uh, you know, training one soldier per step. And if we wanna do that, if you wanna just allocate every resource that we have into soldiers, we can select the converter in the conversion property here where we have it set as single by default, we can switch it to multiple. If we switch it to multiple, it's gonna do all the conversions that it can do in a single step. So if I hit a step, it took my 10, uh, my 100 resources and converted them into 10 soldiers in a single step on the spot, right? So this is the, the role of a converter. I'm gonna leave it to multiple because uh, let's just train all of the soldiers that we can. In this particular uh, model, we will assume that player invests all of the resources into soldiers. So uh, you're gonna train a bigger army every time. Now, uh, the player actions. So the player actions, aside from training the soldiers, what the player will do is send those soldiers to attack other players and uh, steal resources from them and use those resources to uh, grow their army further, right? So let's introduce an attack mechanic, a pretty simple one. I'm just gonna be using a random gate again. I'm gonna be using a random boot with a single output this time. So you're gonna see this is, uh, this is gonna be a bit interesting now. I'm gonna put the output at 70%. So in essence, what this means, let me just run it step by step. I'm gonna have 10 soldiers here. It means that because the input is one, each soldier will go individually through here and there is a 70% chance that they will come out alive, right? 
that's that's even a good analogy for the resource, I would say. So 70% means that there's a 70% chance that the resources actually reaches the pool and a 30% chance that the gate drains that resource. So if we were to go step by step, you saw the first one didn't make it through. The second one did get through. So then at every iteration, there's a 70% chance for that happening. Now, as the first, uh, as the first problem that we faced, which is we were training soldiers one by one for attacking, we should have the same behavior of not just sending one soldier after another. So I'm, I wanna send all soldiers at once. Now, it's not as simple as putting uh, a number here because I'm not always sure how many soldiers I will have. But in this case, as a label on the formula, I can just put all, and if I put all, it means that it will take all of the resources that I have in here and pass them individually to through that 70% chance. And then they come out at the end, right? So if I do a play here, you can see nine of them made out. We can also make this as a number if you wanna track it better. So nine of them uh, made out. Let's call this surviving. Um, now, of course, since we want this to be a loop, um, we want the, the soldiers that actually make it out to return with some resources and go attacking again. Uh, in order to form a loop here, as I did above with a deterministic gate, I'm gonna use the same method here, use a deterministic gate, uh, take all of the surviving soldiers, let's try and make the lines pretty, and return them to the initial soldier patch. So because I want all of them returning again, as we, as we did above on the, on the returning connection, I'm gonna put an all. The output does not to, need to have all because it will just send every single resource in here. So it doesn't really matter. And all of the surviving soldiers will now uh, return. So if I were to, to have this loop, you see the soldiers return and go to battle again, but because they keep dying and dying and uh, we are not training the soldiers, uh, the soldiers will eventually uh, run out. To avoid that and to make the scenario more realistic, the surviving soldiers should actually return with some uh, resources from their attack, right? So in order to simulate that in a simple way, I'm just gonna add an automatic source here that sends resources into the, the resources pool. And we're gonna be using a state connection to alter the amount of resources that the, the, the source sets. So I'm gonna have the formula set to zero here. From the surviving soldiers, I'm gonna point a state connection at the resource connection with a plus five. This means, actually let's run it step by step. We have seven surviving soldiers. Each of these soldiers is gonna carry home five resources. So seven times five, 35 resources is what our player will receive. So in the next step, they're gonna be receiving 35 resources. Soldiers came home. Those 35 resources can be reinvested in training new soldiers. And you see that at the moment, we actually have two armies that are attacking uh, one by one. The four surviving soldiers send back 20 resources and it's a continuous cycle of surviving, uh, surviving soldiers sending back resources, converting them into soldiers and uh, the new soldiers attack and obtain resources. So you can see it's, it's quite a continuous cycle. And the, in this case, with the arbitrary, arbitrary chances of 70% soldiers surviving five resources and everything, you can see that the soldiers are actually kind of in check, right? The army doesn't go too big. Like it's not a positive feedback with the player does not, it's not easy to win, but the army is not completely destroyed either. So the, um, the rewards in this case are kind of uh, similar to the losses in a sense, right? So these numbers, you might want to adjust them. Uh, obviously, if we were to go in depth here, there can be a lot more that can be said. You can, have different types of soldiers, they can carry a different amount, they can have different chances of survivability according to the player that they attack, so on and so forth, different costs. So there's a lot to do here. Um, just to address quickly about what it is we wanna measure. 
Um, so what we want to measure is the total amount of troops that we have and how we're going to do that because we have soldiers in both of these pools. Um, we, we need to make a sum of the two pools to, to keep track of how many soldiers we have. So in order to do that, you're going to see I, I planted a register node in here with the F uh, for function. These are the nodes that can actually do math inside of the, of the model. So you're going to be using them whenever you want to calculate different things. In my case right now, I want to calculate the total amount of soldiers that I own because both of those pools store soldiers. You saw that when I pointed state connections at the register, they are automatically labeled with A and B. Those are actually going to be their variable names. And inside here in the formula, I can just type A plus B and it's going to do the sum between the two. I can name it total soldiers. It's going to do the sum of the two. So let's remove level from chart. Let's add total soldiers in the chart. And we can do the same thing that we did last time, track the total amount of soldiers. We can do 20 batch plays that we clear the chart, do 20 batch plays. And the, the trend should be a bit more linear now than it was last time. It's still, you can see that there is variation between executions. So after this finish, uh, we're gonna see something interesting. Um, it's 80%. You see that some of them are going really well. Some of them are going poorly. Uh, for instance, if I have a look at step 76, we can see that in some simulations we have 35 soldiers, 30, but in some of them we have zero, right? So here we have 100 soldiers, here we have zero. So there's a lot of variation here, right? So in this case, if we were to pull up the indicators, average, minimum, maximum, we see that there's quite a difference between the minimum and maximum, and the average is some, somewhere in between, and it's a fairly linear increase, which is actually what we would expect in this type of situation, right? So uh, now That's a I think great, it's a question. great example of, of really kind of understanding how Monte Carlo and how randomness can impact these models. And one of the great use cases of machinations is that ability to kind of spot those positive uh, reinforcement loops. So especially in this type of mechanic, if the player did start to lose um, members of their soldiers, they had an unlucky attack, whatever, they lost some of their soldiers, actually it means that they're, they're then gathering less resources, which means they have less um, soldiers to attack next time. So a great example of a positive reinforcement loop in, just inside a very, very simple core game loop. Any questions here? Yes, I've seen a couple in chat. Um, there was one quick question, which is just when you had the gate there with the two 50-50 odds, what happens if your total doesn't add up to 50-50? What happens if it's 75-50? So if it's not 50-50, it's actually what, what happened in the, in the second example here, right? Uh, if it's, let's say, 50 with 20, that means there's a 20% chance it will go to win, 50% chance it goes to lose, and 30% chance that the gate just swallows it uh, and drains the resource, right? So if it's below, that's the case. If it's above, so if I have, let's say 100% here and 50% in the other, that's fine because machinations will just look at the ratios between the two. So essentially it will just mean that win has double the chance of lose. Uh, as you can think of it like that. This is 66.66%, this is 33.33, and so on. Perfect. One quick question. Can you just clarify for us the difference between steps and batch plays? So you did some steps, you had, then you ran some batch plays across a number okay. of steps. Do you want to help us make sure everyone's clear on that terminology? Okay, so first of all, the let's say, because someone asked earlier about time, right? In machinations, the concept of time is shown through steps, right? Steps are fixed actions. So if I have a source and a pool and a connection between them, whatever that means in real time in machinations, it will always take one step from the resource to reach the pool from the source, right? So this is fundamental. Uh, steps are fixed in machinations. There is no such thing as half a step, one step and a half, three steps and a half or anything like that. The abstraction that comes here and how you 
should think of time in machinations is what this step signifies to you, right? Because someone was talking about time earlier. In our case, in, in the first example, one step meant one game, right? One game in reality can mean five minutes, can mean 10 minutes, can mean one hour, depending on the game, obviously. It can have a variable duration. It can be between 30 minutes and one hour, like in mobile games, right? Uh, so it's important for you to think of what that step means. Another approach I could have had here, for instance, is to say, okay, one step is I'm gonna simulate a day. And that would have meant that I would have just, let's say our player plays 10 games per day, right? I just put 10 resources in here, put an all on the formula. And now uh, this is one day. I have eight wins and two losses. So this is another way to look at it, right? But it still only happens in a step. So the step is the, is the fundamental, time in machinations, right? It's what they what it means to do an action. An action you know, is always done in a single step. And for batch plays, because that was the question, so when we run normal simulations, like we, we click play here, you can see that it's, it's shown step by step. We have a step speed on the left here. We can select it, we can make it faster, we can make it slower. It's, it's an animated run, right? We can see the resources moving around. We can see everything happening. Uh, it's, it's mostly used to test our logic, right? But if you want to run, let's say a simulation with a thousand steps, you wouldn't want to use play and just sit around for 1000 steps to execute, right? You would want fast results. You know your model is working. You just want fast results. What happens is you use batch plays on the right here. Batch plays essentially run the simulation server side everything, the logic still works exactly the same as in an interactive play, but you get your results uh, way faster because there is a the server side and we don't, uh, the animations are not playing and everything, right? And also you can select the number of batch plays uh, that you can do. You can see that when I did batch plays so far, uh, I use a, a batch of 20. So you can see that on the left here, I actually have 20 separate executions of 100 steps, right? I can select them individually and we can see them. So we can look at them individually. We can look at them as a whole, right? We can look at the averages. So the batch plays is just a quicker method for uh, executing and getting fast results. So okay. in this example, this was, um, we did 20 simulations in one batch play. Um, so yes. that was equivalent to 20 players going through the first hundred battles. Exactly, exactly. If you think if you think of this construction as one player and what a player does, then 20 batch plays would mean exactly 20 players going through the same scenario, right? And yeah. even though the odds are similar, you can see that the results are very different, you could see, so. Perfect. We better, we're, we were worried, Cesar, that we would, wouldn't get through all of these. So we better move on to the next one quickly. Yeah, I'm fairly sure we won't get through all of these, but it's it's fine. I, I, I'd rather take the time and explain this properly than do it rushed. I, it's, you're gonna uh, see that most of them are pretty similar to each other. So there's not really, uh, it's not really that important that we cover all of them. It's more important that everyone understands what we're doing here. Uh, right. So let's uh, talk about an idle game. Well, Nicole yes. Loops idle game. Yes, yeah, so this, this, is a, this is a simple one. It's gonna seem a bit more complicated because I'm actually gonna use a formula here, but uh, idle games are pretty basic. Let's say it, they are very good examples one, once you break them down to show you what a uh, feedback loop is, right? What a positive feedback loop is. Because in an idle game, you store, you, sorry, generate resources passively, right? Through buildings or whatever it means. Uh, you upgrade said buildings using those uh, resources that you gather, that currency, and in turn, they generate more and more. You use those to upgrade them further, they get more expensive, you generate more and more, and it's just uh, a never ending loop of this scenario. So about uh, what are the core mechanics? Uh, we're gonna have our building. Um, I'm just gonna do one, the one building, right? I'm gonna name this building production. So our building is gonna be generating resources every step. Um, we're gonna store this in a pool as we did uh, until now. So this is gonna be currency. Uh, let's say that they start producing five currency per step at level one. So in an idle game, again, you can do this like, if the production is per second, you can have it as one step is one sec. If 
you want to do it more thoroughly, let's say I want to do it per minute, I can just say that it produces five times 60 in a single step, right? So I can even write it like this, it's fine. It will produce the 300. So again, it's up to you how you abstract your steps. I'm just going to leave it as five. And that currency, we're going to upgrade our building and we're going to, um, we're going to use a converter to upgrade the building, right? We're going to turn our currency into level. So this is going to be building level. This is going to be upgrade. Yeah. Upgrade building. Uh, and our building level is in turn going to uh, give us more currency, right? So on a basic level, let's say, let's keep it simple this time building level, every level that we gain will actually, let's make this connection, will actually, let's say, increase our production by five. So every building level we have, will add another five resources to the production. So if we have it like this right now, you can see that we keep producing more and more, but the building cost is always super cheap and the, the level keeps increasing and we're not really spending our currency. Um, something that's very specific to these games is that the building costs get higher and higher and higher until they get to ridiculous numbers. That's usually because of exponential formulas. So I'm gonna be using a simple exponential formula in here. We're gonna be using a register. Uh, what tells us the cost of the building will be our building level, right? So I'm gonna be using that as a variable in here, send it is next A, and we're gonna have our cost. I think I'm just gonna start with a 10, a 10 let's say. Uh, so it's gonna be 10 uh, times power. So I'm using all here, which is basically power. I'm raising to the power uh, 1.15 MA. So let, let's do something, something simple like that. So right now, if I hit play, and you see that the initial cost is 10, and whenever I gain a level, the cost increases. Uh, let's also have it show it in a prettier way. So we see the cost increasing every time. Yes, you're going to have to do that a little bit slower because that's a brand new feature you just clicked on really quickly. Uh, sorry, so yeah, okay. Just explain that a little bit more. <laughs> okay, okay. So these are global settings right now that I'm using. Um, you see, let's say that when I draw a connection, you're going to see that it's it's a straight line. If I actually go to, to my global settings and um, change the connection that I want, so change the connection style here. If I were to draw the, the same connection again, you see that even on the left side here, it's uh, it's shown at the new connection style, right? So I can select it every time. I can select it to remember the last connection. And for the decimals that I just had in here, results decimals, because this was, this was something that we were struggling with. If I leave it as all, you're gonna see that the cost uh, will increase every time, and at some point the numbers will, you know, become very very small and hard to read. What you can do in this case is have the display be uh, a bit smaller. You can choose uh, here the number of decimals if you want. So uh, I, I just use that. You're not losing any uh, decimals. Yes. Not getting rid of them. It's just how they're yes. displayed on the screen. Yes, it's just a it's just a display function. But in our case, uh, I kind of use this, uh, you know, um, it's not really useful here and I'm going to show you why in just a second. So what we want is for this to become the cost of upgrading, right? And uh, aside, it just, it's not worth putting a, putting a plus one in here. We can just put an equal, which essentially means overwrite. And what that's going to do, you see that the 10 just overwrites the, the, the output. So you see the connection is one here. Once I hit step, it's 10, uh, when the cost will increase, it becomes 11.5 and so on. What I wanna show here and what's gonna happen at some point, now it's gonna happen. So it requires 13.22 resources here. I'm gonna to attempt to draw that and you're gonna see that nothing's gonna come out uh, for building level, see? So why is that happening? It's because um, resources cannot be transferred in decimals. Right, this is a very important thing. We cannot transfer half of a resource. We can only transfer integer resources. In my case here, my converter on step, whatever step it was, 
was expecting 13.22 resources, right? Like it is right now. It's expecting 13.22 resources. I cannot transfer integer, uh, I cannot transfer decimals. So what machinations does for the resource connection is it rounds to the nearest integer. So it will round to 13. I will send 13 resources forward, but the converter is expecting this amount, right? So it's not going to convert into anything. How do we bypass this problem? Because we are rounding. Um, the simplest way to do it is to just add a round function into our, uh, into our register here. And this just runs the number for us, right? And processes it before going to, to the connection. And now because it's uh, 13 and it will always be rounded, it, it's always able to, to do it. So you see the cost is increasing exponentially. It's quite slow at the beginning, but in time it gets really, uh, it gets really big. And I actually, that aside from building level, this time I actually want to track the cost just to to show how it uh, how it looks like. Let's add cost in here, and let's do a bit longer. Let's do two hundred steps this time. Clear chart. Um, this is fairly linear, right? Because there's no randomness in here. So the execution will always play out in the same manner. So I can just do a single batch play. There's no need to do multiple. So always, always remember this. If you want to do batch plays, but you have something that is linear, right? There's no randomness in here involved. It will always be the same way. You can just look at it. So you can see how the cost is uh, exponentially increasing, right? At the beginning, it's fairly small steps, small increases and it gets to bigger and bigger and bigger increases, right? Like a staircase with larger and larger stairs to, to climb, right? So this is uh, the, the cost. And this uh, small structure here is basically a skeleton for any type of idle game, right? Adding a new building is as simple as selecting this, duplicating, dragging it below. Now I have my second building in here. The change that I can do is that I need to have my currency all in one place, right? To spend it, and the cost is going to be off of the second building level, and so on. So it's as simple as that when creating new buildings. Any questions? Yes, I think so. Uh, let's. Uh... Let's see, sorry. Uh, the power function, how there is power, like two in the power of three is eight. Yes. Do you want to just, maybe just explain how that power function works. Well, exactly as the question asked, if I were to write in here power two, three, it's gonna raise two to the power of three, right? When I hit, it's gonna be eight. So with, this is the, the base, this is the exponent. Uh, in my case, I am, you're, you're gonna see this a lot, especially in idle games or any type of exponential functions where you have one point small amount that raises to the, to the level. And this creates a nice and smooth exponential function that's pretty forgiving at the beginning, but later on gets really steep. If I were to change this formula even a bit, if I were to make it 1.25 instead of 1.15, it would be a much deeper increase, right? And we would feel it much faster. Uh, so, yeah. But the power function, as as the, the the one who asked the question actually answered it, power to the power to three is actually eight. So it's raising one number to the to the other. Perfect. Is there a way that you could set a special cost for the first few levels and then go into the exponential? Uh, well, formula. yes, if I were to show that here, I fear that it would take a bit more time that, than we have, but I can show you how to set a fixed cost. So the idea is that you would want to have a fixed cost for the first few levels, and then let's say after level 10, for instance, you switch to the exponential formula. The exponential formula you, you already have here, you can put it, you can have it only be applied when you have a condition. So if I have it multiplied by, let's say, a larger than 10. That means that only when my level is higher than 10 will this formula actually be anything else than zero, right? Because whatever the result in the first row is, if I multiply it by zero, it's gonna be zero, right? So for the first 10 levels, this, this cost is gonna be zero. When A is bigger than 10, then A, A bigger than 10 turns into one. 
so the result can actually be used. What you can do for the first 10 levels, let's say you have a cost, well, fixed cost, you can use an array. So by putting square brackets in the formula and putting numbers between them, separated by a comma, let's do 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. This is gonna be an array with the first element being 10, 20, 30, 40. So if I were to have a uh, simple counter here, just to show how it looks like, Basically, this is going to send A as the array in here, and this is going to be the cell of the array that we want to access. So if I do A and B between square brackets, whenever I add a resource in here, it goes through the elements, right? So this you can think of this as the building level. This is going to be the fixed cost. Once you go to, let's say, 10, you can activate this, and the exponential formula comes in, and so on. So it's perfectly possible, yeah. Perfect. Could you just quickly show us on that idle one how you'd connect the first building with the second building? I need a quick copy and paste there. We just want to show how you would link up the second building to show the second building um, being added to it. And then there's a great question, which is once you've got that second building set up, how would you then look at the logic between what's a player going to do? Upgrade the first building or upgrade the second building? <laughs> That's a very theoretical question <laughs> to ask. But yeah, essentially, what I did earlier is uh, you can right click here and you're going to have a bunch of, you can do copy paste if you want. You can so you highlight it all first, duplicate it, copy it. Sorry? So you highlighted it all first. Yes, yes. You... I highlighted, then you can copy or duplicate it. I duplicated it, but I used the shortcut Control D, right? So it just gives you. It gives me a copy of it. It's all selected, so I can drag it, you know, uh, as a as a whole around. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, and then it, so the whole system is pretty similar. The difference would be that <clears throat> we are using the same currency pool, so I would probably drag the currency somewhere in the middle here. It's not going to look pretty, by the way. And uh, just just move this aside. I use the same currency to upgrade both of the buildings. <clears throat> now. You ask, how do I decide the logic? So, so what you've got there now is, so actually, do you want to just show the log how that works at the moment? Yeah, uh, I can show. What that would do to the production if you hit play on that at the moment. So imagine- uh, Sorry, I have the new cost in here, just a sec. So let me remove the condition. Okay. Yeah, let's do step by step, actually. So we have 10 resources in here, right? And we have two possible, um, to possible upgrades. What it's going to do right now is going to select the first one. And it's going to select the first one because um, this is a bit more complicated discussion. But when you select a node here on the top right, you're going to see a number. This represents the ID of the node on the diagram, right? When you have um, decisions to be made where you have to choose one, let's say, or machinations rather, has to choose one of two possible outcomes, it will always prefer the node with the lower ID, right? In reality, if I had 20 resources here, I would just send to both of them. But because I have only 10, I need to choose one of them. It chose the node with the lower ID, uh, which is the one on the top. Now that I have 10 resources, I don't have enough for, for upgrading the first building, but I have enough for the second one. So I'm just gonna choose the second one, right? So this is up to you. You can either let machinations choose. So machinations will kind of choose the most cheap option, right? It will, now that I have 15, I'm gonna to send to the one on the top. Machinations usually chooses the most cheap option, right? But uh, you can also implement some sort of deeper logic here. Uh, I don't wanna really go into detail, but you can do something like uh, the more you upgrade the building, the less likely it is that you will upgrade it, right? Maybe stop at level 20 because it's no longer profitable, you know, simple rules like that, uh, but that's up to you mostly. Perfect. Let me clean up the list. I think we've got some other questions coming in. Uh, yeah, we can do questions. I, uh, it's fine. Actually, I think I think they're kind of commenting back on that same same piece, which is um, someone saying yes, you could use a percentage uh, to randomize the player choice, so you could yes. rather bring those um, converters as automatic. You could set those as passive, then maybe use a gate to trigger them. Yes. Uh, either randomly or you could apply some further logic to it but for a core game loop this is a great way of kind of building this out to show this is the core core um functionality that's going to be 
um, central to the gameplay. But then, I think we're going to need a part two for this webinar. <laughs> we're not even halfway there. I think so. <laughs> it's been one hour. Um, and I think this is a great, great way of kind of um, maybe we, we round it up there. What I'm going to do right now is actually I'm going to make this one um, public and I'm going to share the link for it so everybody can see the model, uh, all of the models that Cesar came up with for today's session. I'm going to post that onto my community profile. Right now, boom, there it is. So I'm going to drop the link of this into the chat so everybody can see uh, what we're doing. And then I'm going to jump back and have a look at some of the questions that we've had come through while I've been doing that. So right there, there's a link um, to the my community page, which is showing that model. Uh, we came up with eight different models. So we came up with, uh, walk us through just what the other ones are. In fact, do you want to open up the final model uh, I've just posted? Yeah, I, uh, yeah, let me open up my version here. There's a bunch of, uh, this is it. Okay. So we have a bunch of models in here. Uh, what what was about to follow with the basic crafting loop? Do you want me to walk through them briefly? Maybe? I think just pretty briefly, yeah, just to give yeah, people yeah. an idea of what you've got here. So that when yes, they look yes. at what they can have. So they can see the basic stuff. crafting loop is essentially players are gathering resources, right, with a random amount. Uh, D20 represents a dice with 20 faces. So at each step, it's like I'm throwing the 20 sided dice and I'm getting the result here. So I'm going to get between one and 20 resources at each step. And I'm using those resources to craft potions. Uh, you can see that converters can have multiple outputs, uh, sorry, inputs can have multiple inputs, using those ingredients to craft potions. And there is a chance I'm going to use those potions in battle or wherever else. So I can adjust the drop rates here. I can adjust the potion cost and maybe make sure that the player does not have too many or too few potions. So this is for the potion part. For the racing game car upgrade loop, I actually <laughs> went back to one of my favorites of all time, which is uh, the Need for Speed Most Wanted from 2005, which is uh, players go racing. They, based on the race, they get uh, an amount of cash. They can use that cash to upgrade their car uh, by upgrading their car, they are able to enter better races, right? And by entering better races, uh, so you can see here when they upgrade in the next step, they can enter better races. Better races have better prizes, so you get better, uh, you get more money to upgrade your car, your car gets better, and it's a continuous loop of going into higher level races and getting better rewards, right? And the cost of upgrading your car also increases. So uh, this is just a simple loop for a, a racing car game, but it does not have to be a racing car game, right? It can be any type of game that uses this type of, of mechanic. For the trading car game, briefly, um, I'm looking at what happens on the board, right? When two, two players battle each other, what happens is that uh, on their turn, a player will play cards and will use those cards to attack the other player. Then the next turn comes, the second player can play their own cards. They can remove the first player's cards. They can attack the first player. And it's just a continuous loop of the two players playing their cards and attacking the opponent and destroying their, their cards in play, right? So I'm making a lot of use of triggers in here. As you can see, I have quite a bit of triggers coming from gates, which I'm using to generate cards, destroy cards, destroy the player's HP, and so on. And this carries on until one of the player gets to, to zero. So pretty basic loop. Uh, for the mining game loop, uh, this one I took inspiration from, from Minecraft kind of. Um, it's a very simple loop. It's just uh, the process of getting resources, creating your pickaxe. That pickaxe then enables you to mine better resources, use those resources to create a better pickaxe. And it's a continuous loop of getting better tools, thus being able to farm better resources, thus getting better tools and farming better resources and so on. It's more about showing how conditionals work, right? So once I have a pickaxe, I'm able to mine cobblestone and so on and so forth based on conditionals. And the final one, which was supposed to be the, the same most complex one was the farming game loop where I have my seeds. Um, briefly, I'm gonna talk about the delay node here, the one with an hourglass. What the delay node does is it keeps the resources. You can see that I have 10 resources that entered but they're not exiting in the following step. 
because the four here actually means that the delay will store those resources for four steps inside, right? So this is kind of the growing period for the seed. Once the seeds are done, I'm going to convert them into money and I can use these, uh, these $30, let's say, to buy new seeds, more expensive seeds, plant them again after a while. It's going to be some steps. Those mature, I can sell them for even bigger profits, buy newer seeds, and so on. It's just a continuous loop of buying newer seeds, more expensive ones, planting them, and getting more money, and so on. Right. So this is these are most planting games uh, essentially. Uh, yeah, and that was the final loop, I believe, that we had for today. Perfect. Thank you, Chisa. A couple of quick questions. First one is. How complicated is it to prevent the soldiers from attacking simultaneously as troops returning? So, um, super not simple. I would grab a, a state connection from the resources pool to the attack pool um, that says uh, the, the attack pool will only be active, sorry, the attack gate will only be active if there's a um, less than 10 resources in the resources pool. Uh, let's try your option, Matthew, actually. So you're saying uh -huh. that less than 10, right? Less than 10. Right. So what would happen in this case? See, we're waiting for, first we build our troops, then, so let's do it step by step so we can see. We have our resources now. Normally our troops will attack at this point, but we have a bunch of resources that we haven't built our army with yet. So we're building our army first, and then we are attacking. So a very good solution found by Matthew. That there can be several other, but yeah, this this one works. So yeah, as with anything in machinations, there's always lots of different ways of doing it. Most important rule to remember is if you hit play and it does what you want it to, you've got a good model. Don't yes, don't get bogged down in um, is it the right way or the best way. If it works for you, that's what. That's what's important. Yes, for some people would find it more intuitive to add a different rule here. So for instance, my first thought was to base it off surviving troops. Only when there are no troops in here can the, the players actually initiate an attack. That was my first thought, right? You see, Matthew had a different thought. Both of them would have produced the same result, so. Perfect. Um, seeing all diagrams doing their steps when using batch play, I'm wondering if I can specifically select which part to play um maybe via layers now i know stefan's left but for the recording we'll we'll answer this question anyway so um layers don't disable any part of the model um if a layer is visible or not that logic's still there it's still operating it's still doing its thing um but if you wanted to only see certain parts really via the batch play it's whether or not you've added those elements to the chart so if you've added that object or that register to the chart it's going to show up in the chart but you can then select what you've been doing so as we've been going through today each time chesar's looked at the chart he's turned off the the last object turned on or added to the chart the next object he wants to track the important metric and then run the batch plays that way Anything you add to that, Chesa? No, oh, that's fine. I can just explain what the layers are for people that don't know. Uh, you see that we have an option here for layers. You can see that I have a background layer, which is my general layer. I can hide it and show it. I can generate new layers, untitled. I'm selecting my notes here. I have an option, move selection to layer. If I choose to hide it, I can hide it, but it's still working in the background. So if I hit play, you're still gonna be seeing resources going back and forth. So it's still working in the background. It's just used for visual, for clearing visual clutter. So those are the layers that Matthew was talking about. Perfect. Um, how can I set different experience costs of for the first couple of levels? I think we did that. Are we yeah. answered? And this was super big, complex question right at the start. I said if we could hold off till the end. Mm -hmm. um, so it's I have an issue with implementing the next logic. Users are able to get loot boxes that can have different levels and based on their level content can be different. So 
basically, depending on where the player is in their journey, they can receive a box that's going to have different types of content. Um, and based on some content items, the amount of content can be different. So not only is there different content, there's different amounts of the content. Uh, how would you implement a dynamic array to execute calculations in a particular sequence? So I'm guessing it's like a, a kind of um, a loop box mechanism, which is going to have those type of variables. Yeah, so I, I'm actually wondering here, I don't know if the person that asked that is actually here, uh, but it, when you're talking that it has variable and uh, amounts and variable rarities and whatever, are you saying that, let's say I am in my game and I am in this, let's say this is point one of my game. And uh, let's also have a point two in here. So you're saying that if I get a loot box from point one and if I get a loot box from point two, they're gonna be different loot boxes basically. But my question is this loot box that I received from point one. So if I get this loot box, are, are the contents of this particular loot box from point one uh, do they have the same possibilities of, of prizes inside or not? Because that's a different, like those are two different approaches. If, if the loot box that I get from point one always has the same probability of, I don't know, let's say having, uh, let's say they have three outcomes, right? You get a rare epic or legend that whatever, doesn't matter. Uh, and you have a random gate in here and you have your three chances. I'll just leave it as one, one, one. So the loot box that comes from point one will also always have one of these three outcomes, right? So I don't know if that's the case or not. What you made it sound like is you have your loot box and your loot box actually has to go through a series of decisions to decide what it contains. So this is basically, if I were to open a loot box, this is me opening the loot box. This is my first decision, which is I have to decide how many items there are in here, right? So this would be my first decision, uh, which is basically, do I have, let's say three, four five items. Then if I have three items, I have another decision to make, which is rarity. Uh, are they gonna be rare items? Are there gonna be epic items and so on? So it looks to me, it's either one of the two. Either you know what your loot box is giving you, in which case from that point, you can just, offer the player that loot box with, with those outcomes, or you decide on the spot, in which case it's gonna be a branch of different decisions that the loot box takes in order to reach a final value, right? That's the way I see it. Does it make sense? At least to you, Matthew, I hope. <laughs> no, I think that, that's, that's great. I mean, there are so many different ways of kind of looking at that type of logic. Um, and I think you've, you've shown a couple of those kind of options. If you, depending on kind of what the results that you want to simulate. So I'm guessing that what you want to be able to test and the important metrics that you want to be able to understand is how does your logic for your loot crate system work or loot boxes? How does that work? How does that impact the player progression? Um, so really it's all about kind of work, building out the mechanics that simulate your loot system in the best way there's two examples there. There's probably another half dozen at least different ways you could approach the same thing. But it's all about kind of um, building up the logic so that it's simulating it in the right way. You could do this with um, arrays where you had a player level and you had a um, a player level or their progression. Uh, so it was based off of their level and a few other things. You could do that in uh, as a lookup array. So you could have a, the player level, and then that was uh, an array that I had how many rewards each different level were to receive, and that would impact your loot crate mechanic. Uh, yeah, and, and if you use the the, bar, the method on top, and you, you are worried that it would take too many steps to reach a final result, you can skip the pools here, right? And just send the results straight into the game, right? Because yeah. the gates are executed with them. So you're not losing any time. Basically, it will reach the end result in a single step if you want to do it that way. So that's, I think this is the best option for you. You can condition all of these outputs based on, as you said, player level, place in game, whatever the, the criteria is. You can condition all of these outputs and then you are only left with the ones that are actually possible for the player's current state, right? So I think that would be the best option for you. Perfect. Um, 
this has been a really great session. We've really enjoyed um, this today. Uh, one question I have is if people, if anybody would like us to do another one of these sessions, either just looking at game loops and we could go through some more of these in some more detail, or if there's any particular genre you'd like us to focus on and maybe expand out a little bit more, please do let us know in the chat or in the in feedback or just get in contact with us. We're always looking for ideas of what content to create in these sessions that people are most interested in. So please do let us know in the Discord, let us know in the Slack or in the chat, anything you'd be really interested in us doing. Um, an RPG skill tree would be interesting to explore. We can certainly do that. Yeah, we can certainly do that, yeah. I don't, we've done, I don't think we've done anything. Like I, that. I, I, that's what I was thinking right now. Have we actually done this or not? Because it sounds like something we did. I don't remember. It might have been a webinar. It might have been a YouTube live streaming. Even if there's any OG in the audience who remembers those. Yeah, skill skill trees. All right, done. Me and Cesar will come up with some skill tree ideas uh, and do one of those in one of the next sessions. Um, okay. Uh, so just to kind of wrap up today's session, uh, we really enjoyed it today. This has been great. Thanks for everybody's input as we've been going through. Your questions always add so much value to these processes. Um, please do, if you're at Gamescom, get in contact with us. We'd love to meet with you. We love talking to game designers uh, about machinations and just love to get your feedback on machinations as well. So please do come and say hi to us and look out for us there. Uh, we'll drop in the links for our amazing YouTube channel where this video will be posted up next week sometime. I've already posted the link to the system. Uh, we've posted the Discord links. What have I forgotten to do, Cesar? There's always something I've forgotten at the end of these sessions. Uh, we'll remember it after we close the session, I'm sure. That's true. I'll remember it the second <laughs> I click the you'll finish button. How important can it be if you've forgotten it? Come on. That's true. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Please do enjoy the rest of your day. And we look forward to, to chatting with you soon and seeing you in one of the next sessions. Um.